So welcome guys, we have with us Australia's World Cup winning captain. He is one of the greatest captains, the greatest knights and the greatest batsman of all time to have ever played the game, Steve Paw. Welcome Steve Paw. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Very good. How is the lockdown treating you right now? Um, not too bad. We've been lucky in Australia, um, in Victoria, it's not too good. But New South Wales, we're okay and um, the numbers are staying down. So everyone seems to be doing the right thing at the moment. So we've been pretty lucky and pretty fortunate. So I know there's been a lot of um, problems all around the world, including India. So hopefully things get better soon. Okay. So do you move out anytime or do you know, hang around or something like that? Sorry? Do you move out of the house? Yeah, yeah, we still still can move around in uh, in Sydney. Um, just social distancing, and most people are wearing masks now, and um, yeah. making sure they you know, clean their hands and be very careful what they're doing. But uh, yeah, so we've been lucky in Sydney. It hasn't got to the stages where most countries where you can't leave the house and you've got to be restricted. So we've we've been very lucky so far. Okay, so uh, talking about the book that you recently wrote, uh, that's titled "The Spirit of uh, the Spirit of Cricket in India." What is, it, what is it about? Would you like to give some insights about it? Uh, how was your overall journey while visiting India while you wrote the book? Yeah, look, it's more a photographic book, more so than a written book. Um, it's called The Spirit of Cricket. And the idea was to capture through my lens um, what my definition or what my idea of the spirit of cricket is in India and what makes it a religion. So it's not so much about capturing the superstars, although we, I did get a, a fantastic photo of Sachin Tendulkar and Rahul Dravid. It was more about uh, grassroots cricket and uh, going to the, the Maidans and, and seeing all the kids playing there, going to the Girls Cricket Academy in Dharamshala, the, the blind cricket in Bangalore, physically challenged cricketers. Um, and we had spent some time with a three-year-old uh, batting prodigy up in Calcutta, a, a seven-year-old boy who, or eight-year-old boy who practices 30 hours a week. Um, the oldest living cricketer, unfortunately, just passed away um, in Mumbai, who was 100 years of age. So... We did a cross section of people, and um, and and then we got in a uh, bus and we drove all around India, and we stopped when we saw a game of cricket. So it was, it was fascinating to, to to be a part of that. So, uh, how did the primary idea of that evoke in you to capture um, such well, moments in India, especially? Yeah, well, I, I've been touring India since 1986, and um, obviously, when you're in the Australian cricket side, you can't get out of a bus and take photos. It's just not possible. You get um, I guess surrounded by lots of people and people get excited and you can't really take those photos. So I've always looked out the bus window and, and seen these amazing sights, um, kids playing cricket in the alleyways, um, the foot of the Himalayas, um, in the streets, um, on cricket grounds, basically wherever they uh, could set up a, a, a set of stumps and find a bat and ball, they had a game of cricket. And I wanted to capture that through the lens and after 15 years being retired, um, I gave me the liberty of uh, a bit of freedom when I stopped on the side of the road to take photos. Um, people still knew who I was, but it wasn't the same fanaticism as when I was playing for Australia. Okay. So during your visit, as far as I've learned, uh, so you visited, you saw some monks playing cricket and you mm. visited the Mathura River where the where cricket was being played and the desert cricket and the beach cricket. What are yeah. those takeaways from that from that journey? Uh, just the passion. Enjoy the most? Yeah, I enjoyed them all, but the passion of the, the, the people playing cricket and um, uh, they didn't need many material possessions. As I say, just a bat and ball was required. Some stumps could be made out of bricks or, uh, or a garbage bin or um, drawn on the wall. So that was pretty simple. But, yeah, I loved playing on the beaches. Um, the thing was, was, it was very competitive wherever I went. And I joined in a lot of those games and got I got bowled out quite regularly. So um, the beach cricket, they were too good for me. Um, in the desert, that was an amazing setting for a game of cricket. Playing in the in the Maharaja's Palace in uh, in Baroda was incredible, um, and yes, everywhere, everywhere I went, um, yeah, you know, people just loved the game. And the great thing was that you know people were off their, their mobiles, they were actually playing cricket, not listening uh, to their phone or looking at their messages and trying to type something. They were actually playing a game of sports. So I think that was pretty refreshing to see. Okay, so when you see India as a cricket-centric nation, what are those factors that differentiate India for you? Uh, as a cricket-centric uh, nation from other nations? Um, a lot of similarities to Australia, actually. Um, you know, wherever you can get a, a, a space and a bit of land and a bit of time, you have a game of cricket. But for, for me, India is... Um, I just think the passion which they play the game, it was, um, it was always played in good nature, so there wasn't... I didn't see too many arguments. Um, but everyone was um, committed to what they were doing. Uh, even if there was hundreds of cricketers on one piece of land, they all seemed to sort of... Um, 
get along with each other. There was no collisions, no arguments. Um, but everyone was playing with such passion and determination, and you could see them emulating the heroes. There was a lot of um, Vera Coley's batting and MS Donies and Tendulkers, and and, um, and so they were copying the heroes. And it's great to have role models, and uh, particularly the young kids. They seem to be practicing seriously, and they could see. I guess a lot of them can see that it, it may be a profession they could take up later and actually make a living from. So um, a lot of them were trying really hard to make it to the next level. Okay, pretty well. So taking cue from your passion for Indian cricket and for India, you made your test debut against India and you played your last test against India. Uh, what was your overall journey playing against India in India and in Australia against India? Uh, yeah, I played a lot, a lot of cricket against India, but the first 10 years there wasn't a lot because we... Um, I think it was 10 years between series, 1986. The next one was 10 years later. So um, we never used to play a lot, which was unfortunate. But now it's played every couple of years, which is great. Um, some amazing memories. The, the World Cup in 87, uh, that was the turning point for Australian cricket. Um, that famous 2001 series, even though we lost, it was still one of the best series I've played in. In front of massive crowds. I mean, 95,000 people a day in Calcutta was incredible. So they were life-changing experiences to, to play in front of those sort of crowds and that atmosphere. Um, and, you know, it was always very competitive. And um, I think Australia-England is, is probably still our main series, the Ashes, but the Border Gavaska Trophy is not far behind. And, um, you know, for players, it's, it's a, one of those series which really is a pinnacle of your career playing against India in a, in a full Test match series these days. And often India and Australia are the two best um, Test-ranked teams in the world. I think that's probably the case right now again. Okay, see, you mentioned the 2001 series wherein uh, India defeated Australia. You were a part of that. You were captaining the side at that time. And uh, while entering the Kolkata test, which was the second test, you, especially after you won the Mumbai test, what was your mi- mindset entering that test, the Eden Gardens test? Uh, I like to play in the same, same manner, play in the same spirit, to play to win. We went there to play for drawn test matches. Um, <clears throat> so our confidence was high and we, we, we tried to you know, make it 17 tests in a row. But yeah. obviously, Dravid and Laxman had something to say about that. And, Play that amazing partnership, uh, but that, that's test match cricket. Uh, sometimes the opposition is just too good. But for me, I wanted to go on a tour to India. Uh, we hadn't won there f- um, a series, so to me, it was about being aggressive and positive and trying to get a result. You mentioned about Dravid and Lakshmi. How was that particular stand, that particular partnership, to you uh, while looking at them from the field? Although I wanted to get them out, but you know, they were too good for us on that day. So that, that sport, um, you got to sit back and admire sometimes and congratulate people the way they played. And that was one of those times where it was just amazing batsmanship and skill. And, and uh, they turned the game around and, and, and won a game that seemed like it was, was lost. So it was, um, for India, a great test match victory. Okay, so in your final test series, uh, you played your final test at Sydney at your home ground. Uh, in that series, Dravid yet again turned a big game for India at Adelaide. So, uh, during that period, we had India's golden run. How, do, how did you compare that era from 2001, where Ganguly started it, India's golden uh, run? Uh, yeah, look, they were all strong Indian sides in that whole era. So, mm-hmm. hard to say which was the better side, but um, they had some great players, particularly the batting lineup was um, yeah, one of the greatest batting lineups in Test match history. And um, that was always a challenge and had some really good bowlers. I mean, Harbhajan had a great record against Australia. Um, and our Kumbla took two great spinners there and did some quick, quick in Sri Lanka. And um, that's continued on now with India having a really fantastic pace attack. So I think from 2000 onwards, uh, the Indian side became very strong and it's, um, it's continued to uh, you know, be one of the best sides in world cricket. So during your visit to India, you, uh, you met some aspiring cricketers, young prodigies. So Master Blaster Sachin Tendulkar was similar was such a prodigy, a team prodigy. Do you have any initial memories of seeing him play on the cricket field? When he was Sachin? young? Yeah. Um, yeah, his first series in Australia, I, I was actually not in that series. I was dropped at the time, but it was quite obvious from the start that he was something special and um, his technique was incredible, his temperament, um, his, his hunger for runs and running between the wickets, I think, is often underrated. He was very quick and um, turned, you know... Um, yeah, singles into twos and, uh, you know, he, he made the most of every shot. So, yeah, he was always destined for stardom, but uh, longevity in the game is hard to do. And he played 23 or 24 years for his country, which um, I'm not sure anyone's ever going to do again. So, an incredible record and a, an amazing player. What were your takeaways from the ball factory? How was it different, the one the, in the, India? The bat factory? 
the ball in bad factory. Yeah, yeah oh, look, I just thought it was incredible how it was all so well organised and so well coordinated. Um, everything was handmade, um, shaping the bats and then hand stitching the balls and um, you know cutting out the pads and gloves and everyone seemed to have their job to do. So it was an amazing uh, sense of teamwork and and pride in what what people were achieving. Um, so I was sort of um, mesmerised by the skill level and uh, the commitment and just the dedication to work. And, um, you know, I think as players, sometimes you take it for granted the, the gear you're using, but when you see it actually being made, uh, it makes it even more special. Okay, so we were talking about the initial memories of Sachin Tendulkar when you first saw him. Uh, how did you spot that talent in him when you first saw him, not in the initial series he played in, in Australia, when you first spotted him? Um, oh, look, it wasn't me, for me to spot him. The Indian selectors obviously did a pretty good job in doing that, but um, yeah. I think he obviously had great composure. Oh, right. oh, just his composure was stood out and his skill and just ability to handle pressure uh, from an early age. was um, He was made for Test Match cricket, and you saw that. He just kept churning out runs and he had insatiable hunger to score runs and to to represent India and to and to handle all the pressure of you know one point three or one point four billion people expecting him to do well, he seemed to really embrace it and love it. Okay, speaking about histories, you were yourself a part of a historic Test match in nineteen eighty six, which was which was tied in Chennai. Uh, what what was the reaction? What was the atmosphere when uh, Greg Matthews took that final wicket on the final day? Um, oh, a lot of emotions because you know we probably outplayed India in that whole test match and we looked like we were going to lose it and then it was a roller coaster and, and to come out with a tie we were, we were I think pretty elated and pretty happy because for us coming to India we were the complete underdogs and, and people didn't expect us to do that well and then to handle those tough conditions and situations against a very good Indian team um, in an amazing cricket match that probably hasn't um, got the um, I guess the, the just desserts of um, being recognised one of the great games of cricket because it was and um, it sort of set the tone for future battles between Australia and India. It, was, um, you know, it elevated the, um, the contest to a different level and it gave it recognition. Okay. Speaking about the rivalry of India and Australia, we've had some terrific matches right from 2003 World Cup, and the 1987 World Cup and uh, the 2008 Test Series. Uh, uh, in 2018, India visited Australia and they defeated Australia on the home soil. Do you mm. think this time around with... Steve Smith and David Warner, they are going to be hard on the Indians. Oh, no doubt. I mean, when you have two world-class players not there, it makes a big difference to your confidence. And I think India sensed that and to their credit played really well last time. But I think Australia will be harder to beat this time around. And, um, you know, and also you've got the COVID-19, which makes it difficult for touring side. They're going to be sort of um, probably locked up in hotels and not being able to get out of the hotel. I think it's going to be and maybe a bit of homesickness comes into play when you're away from home for a long time. So it'll be a challenging tour for India. Um, but yeah, they'll expect to do well in Australia. They've got a, an excellent side, capable of playing well in all conditions. But Australia will be tough for no doubt with Smith and Warner. And obviously, Lubbershane's turned into a world-class player in the last couple of years as well. So the batting is much stronger. Okay. And if we talk about the Indian captain, Virat Kohli, do you see shades of Ricky Ponting in him? The, the aggression and the passion to play for the country. Yeah, well I think there's, yeah, there's certainly a bit of certainly got passion. That um, I think it's he's got his own style too, and he's um, he's toned it down, which is good. I think he still has that um, that burning desire and hunger underneath, and uh, but he's calmed himself down a bit on the field, which is good for his fellow yeah. players because the captain needs to stay under control. But um, you know, he um, he loves to play for India, and he's passionate, which is great. And, I think Ian has really respond to that. So he's, he's a really good leader by example. But yeah, most importantly for India, he scores millions of runs. Mm-hmm. And we have had some great captains, Kapil Dev and MS Dhoni, for example. Uh, we, we have heard you about MS Dhoni. And what are, you, what are your thoughts on Captain Cool? Yeah, all great players. I, 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 unfortunately, I never got a chance to play against MS Dhoni. I would love to have played against him because he looks like the ultimate competitor. And um, would have loved to have... Um, been on the field, uh, tussling with him out in the middle and in the heat of battle because it, um, that's when he played his best. And I think it's probably when I played my best when um, the pressure was on. But um, yeah, India have been fortunate recently with uh, you know, Saurav Ganguly and uh, MS Dhoni and Virat Kohli, three fantastic captains, all, all with different styles. Um, so they've, And that's no coincidence that India have um, become a world-class side in the past 20 years. They've had really good leaders. 
Okay, speaking about MS Dhoni, he was a very tactical and analytical captain. Do you draw some similarities of captaincy styles with you, of his captaincy styles? Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, maybe it is. I mean, it's um, it's nice to be compared with such a player. Um, but yeah, look, I think you know he he always had a good strategy. And you're watching him bat in the one day. I mean, he was always under control and calm, even when other people around him were thinking he's left it too late or what's he doing here. He um, he always had a plan in the back of his mind. Most times it came off. So I think the great thing about Donny as a captain was that on the field he stayed composed and never got too flustered. He never got carried away when things were going well and he never got too down when it wasn't going so well. He was always pretty calm and I think that um, had a good good influence on the rest of the players under his, under his leadership. Okay, so talking more about your book, was it hard strolling on the streets of India and capturing such beautiful moments from your camera? Um, no, I, I really enjoyed the process. I, I took a really great photographer with me, a guy called Trent Park, who's probably Australia's best photographer and he's part of Magnum Photography and he was basically coaching me and teaching me how to take photographs um, in a different way. I wanted to use a manual setting on the camera. I want to try and understand light a bit more, capture mood and attitude and um, you know, for me it was a learning process and I love being out in the streets meeting people and going to different places. Um, you know, some beautiful places in India. Yeah, Dharam Shala was, was amazing up there and um, they say on the beaches and uh, out in the desert. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a whirlwind, 17, 18 days. But, um, yeah, I took 20,000 photos. Um, I've got it down to the final 300 now, and um, I'm really happy with the book. I think it's a fantastic quality, and hopefully it's a, a good present for an individual, maybe a, a good corporate gift uh, for a company to give away. So you, uh, during your visit, you also hovered around the blind cricket and disability cricket players. What were your takeaways from that? The- were you amazed by them bowling and yeah. batting and feeling all around? Yeah. Oh, uh, look, I, you know, after you um, get over the initial um, thought that you know they're blind or physically different, then I just saw them as cricketers, and uh, and the girls' cricket academy is great as well. And I just think they they were really good cricketers. First, that's the main thing I took away from it that they were talented, uh, they were disciplined, and they were committed. So I was really amazed at um, just the the quality of play, but. Um, the competitiveness and after a while I was just like I was watching normal cricketers it was you know all those um you know, words that we're using about them didn't really relate because um to me they were just um fantastic athletes and with, with high skill level so I was very impressed by all of them okay so we discussed about your great memories uh, from the streets and beaches of India which is, if I ask which is that uh, one great or the greatest memory of you on the cricket field in India um, it's hard to go past you know, winning the World Cup in 1987. 100,000 people at Eden Gardens when we beat England by seven runs and most of the crowd was cheering for Australia. So that was like playing a home game in India. Um, that's an amazing moment. Um, and scoring a test century at Calcutta many years later. Um, that's also a highlight. But um, yeah, they're, they're probably the, the couple that st- stand out right now. Okay. So, uh, Steve, I'll quickly ask some rapid-fire questions from you. You will have to answer yes or no, and you will have to give a reason for that. One mm-hmm. reason and one answer. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So, the first question. The Australian team is known for, is really known for sledging, which is that one moment, uh, that one, you know, aura or moment you find really tough in the opposition uh, related to sledging. One player, you say, or...? The one opposition you find it hard when it comes to sledging. Oh, first of all, I don't agree with your comment. I think we played the game in the right spirit. It's called banter, not sledging, and every team does it. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, yeah. Um, I think for India, Harbhajan was pretty good at um, a bit of banter on the field. So, you know, India gave as good as they got most of the times. Yeah. Mm. Then Dulkar or Lara, the toughest opponent for you? Um, equal. Equal cool. in different ways. Um, you know, um, Lara was probably more up and down a bit. Sachin was very even. Like, you always knew that Sachin was going to score runs with Brian. You never knew whether he was going to go big or go small. But against Australia, he generally did well. So, uh, very hard to split those two. Uh, okay, the third question. Did Saurav Ganguly really made you wait at the toss? He's denied it on several occasions. Uh, look, he, was, he, he probably needs a, a new watch, but um, he was always a, a little <laughs> bit late. But... Oh, it's one of those things, you know, it was, it was a bit of fun really looking back. And it wasn't too serious. Um, mm-hmm. It was more the match referee was wanting us to both be out, come out of the field at the same time. So it was maybe a fraction late. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, the fourth one. Which is the most fearsome fast bowler, Australian fast bowler of all time? Uh, probably Jeff Thompson, because yeah, you didn't know where the ball was going, and it was going 100 miles an hour, so he would have been the scariest to face. Okay, and the last one. The one batsman you would never want to bowl to? Um, I think, well, I think you always want to bowl to the great, great players. So I, I always enjoyed that. Um, I think anyone who's a bowler would love to have had a bowl at Bradman. So um, I think um, I'll probably turn that question around and say that um, you know, the one person I would love to have had bowled to would be uh, would be Don Bradman. Okay, so that's it. Would you want to share something more about your book? Something endearing, something exciting. Uh, look, I just think it was it was special doing. It. I've always wanted to capture that, and I think it's um, I've come up with a pretty unique product, and really happy with the quality of the photo. So I'd love Indians to have a look at it and share it. It's um, you know, it's a different type of book. It's a it's a corporate coffee table gift book, but uh, also individuals can get it for their mates. Um, so yeah, look, I just encourage you to have a look at it. Um, and and judge me by the uh, the standard of work in the books. So I'm really happy with it, and it was a pleasure to to be going around India to try and capture the spirit of cricket. Okay, Steve. It was a pleasure having you, Steve, on our, on our show. And all the, all the very best for your book. Yes, thank you. Thank you.